uh, an awesome time of how do we live a life of faith in the world today? It's a great question. How do we do that? First uh, week that we looked at this series, we talked about faith that works against fear. A lot of us have fear in our lives, and so uh, in order to work, uh, that is the opposite, of course, the faith that we have, and so we need to know how to combat that fear, and the only way to is with faith in God. And so we talked about that, and we talked about how this letter that we're looking at in James is going to be a really practical letter and humbling, and it's also going to be very personal to us uh, as we're diving into it. We talked about the author, who was James, the half-brother of Jesus. We looked at the date. It was written around 44 to 49 AD, to remind you about when this was written. It was the first work that we have that was really written about the New Testament. Uh, And so it's important to catch what the first work is all about. Uh, and to see what was really happening in the life of the church in that day and age. We talked about the location. It was written from Jerusalem uh, to a lot of Jews. That was the audience, Jewish believers who had put their faith and trust in God. But they were dispersed. They were scattered. There was a problem. There was persecution in the land. And so people were sacrificing everything and leaving where they were at because they were free, fearful that really their life may be over. Uh, Christians were being killed, and they were being martyred, and they were being mistreated, and so many packed up their bags and left. And so those believers had to put their faith and trust in God. And so James, I believe, wrote that letter to make sure he was there to encourage the believers who were fearful about what was going on and how to live out their lives in a faithful way in the midst of a world that was really hostile toward them. So today we can learn about that as well. So we talked about that, about dealing with our fears, and then we talked about dealing with doubt. The only way to deal with doubt is really to put our faith and trust in God and know that sometimes it's just not going to make sense, but know that God can still make things happen. And so we talked about that, about fear and doubt and its difficulty when we're faced with that in the world. And what do we do with that? And so we know and understand that God gives us some clarity in his word of how to live and how to do that. And he revealed that to us the last time that we met on this series was talking about wisdom about asking God for that wisdom who helps to give that to us and we all need that to be able to deal with the things that go on in our lives. Now, James shifts a little bit of gears into the difficulties of what some of the people were struggling with. And so in this message I've titled Faith That Works Against Worldliness. Worldliness, devoting sometimes ourselves in connection with the affairs and the interests and the pleasures of this world. Oftentimes that's what worldliness is. We're focused too much sometimes on the things of this world rather than what God has in store for us and what he wants us to really accomplish with our lives. I can remember when I moved here into this area and people were telling me it was a big deal about where you went to high school. You know, it was a big deal. And so wherever you move, make sure you position yourself where you're going to this school or that school uh, because it's a big deal. Back where I came from in Florida, it was just a big deal that you went to high school. Just the difference, I guess. And so I can imagine and see this of all of this going on as it's a big deal where you grew up. I can remember when we were uh, moving here and the the, the questions abound with us is, you know, where should we live and what should we, you know, where should we put our lives and and plant? And I can remember some that were telling me, you know, it's a big deal. You don't want to live across the river. (laughs) The statement of going anywhere like, hey, listen, you got you got St. Charles, you got St. Peter's, you got O'Fallon. And I heard the statement is, but you don't want to go across the river. And I'm like, why? What's so bad with the Missouri? It's okay. The Missouri River. And so, you know, as I'm learning about the, where we're at and the things that we think about, I thought about this situation in life. As we're faced with a lot of these dilemmas of what do we do? What do we think about in this world? And how do we handle it? Interestingly enough, by the way, I've got a little cold and I'm taking Sudafed, which apparently you cannot buy in St. Charles without a doctor's note. But guess what? You can go across the river. You can get all you want. Okay, sorry. That's a side point. Bridge dinner or city, here I come, you know, to get that city fed. But it's just the way that it is. And so it's easy to place ourselves inside of this world system that we have and where we live in and what we do. And oftentimes we focus more on the things in this life that oftentimes don't matter in the light of eternity. The things, the possessions, the daily issues and the daily struggles. But I believe God wants us to see here the key to a great life is a godly life. It's a life surrendered to him. So as we look at this passage and we talk about faith that works against worldliness, we talk about status and materialism and greed is all kind of covered in this passage today. And so if you have your Bibles, James chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 12 this morning. It's going to be on the screen, so if you don't have your Bible, that's okay. Follow me on the screen. It says this, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. 
and the rich in his humiliation because like the flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers falls, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Catch verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. James now diving into the worldly issues of the day that the people were struggling with during that time period. People were struggling with the issue of poverty and of wealth and of status. And these Jewish followers that were scattered all throughout the area, this is what was happening, is people were relocating their lives. And so some were leaving good jobs and good situations of status and taking up and moving because they wanted to continue to walk in a manner that brought glory to God and they didn't want to die and so they're spreading out all throughout the region and the area and so they're leaving a lot of that comfort of what they had and so some were rich and some were poor and some are now poor and rich and so everything starts to kind of shift with where they are going and what's happening and today our world is much like this as well oftentimes we have and have not and so we figure out what do we do with what we have and we turn to God and say what should I do with the things that I have You know, there are always going to be people who have more and people who have less. It's always going to be in our society that case. Jesus even said it this way, for you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. So today, where do we live and maybe what do we possess? And even more, I think about in the situation with all these things we have to worry about in the world. I'm going to ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you in the past week have had something break? Something fall apart that you're like, or the past month or the year that you're like, I had this and it was great and all of a sudden it broke. I'm sitting on Monday night, I'm getting ready for bed and I'm like, yeah, it's going to be a great night to get ready for bed. I have a retainer. Anybody else? Okay, if I have braces twice and I don't want to have them again. And so I have a retainer and so I put it on every night before bed and I go to put it on Monday night and I hear pop. I said, it's not supposed to make that noise. And I look and I pull it out and my retainer, the wire's broken. I'm like, ugh, nuts. I don't have an orthodontist because <laughs> I moved from Florida. So I called up the orthodontist and he said, yeah, we can get that fixed. And so I came in and boom, fixed it for 150 bucks later. I'm going, man, this stuff just, I can't trust in any of this stuff. It's broken. Yesterday, my wife and I, we were having fun, had a AC repairman come out to our house. Our AC wasn't smelling right. Okay, you're like, it's, it's coming, you turn it on because now we're in the season, right, where we turn on the AC. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm turning it on, and we're like, that just doesn't smell right. And so we're like, let's call the guy and figure out what's going on. And he's like, yeah. He's like, here's the deal. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I hear the words, here's the deal, (laughs) it's not going to be good. And so he feels to tell us, oh, yeah, you've got leaks in your coil, and here's the deal. And so we're going, hey, let's get a home warranty. Okay. So this is the thing that happens, right? Some things in our lives and the things of this world we just can't trust. And so we're going to look at that today and talk about some of the things. Or maybe some of you today that have struggled in your jobs and finances and situations of there. And whatever the case may be, in the light of eternity, some of these things don't really matter. But to us, the temporal things matter a lot. And so how do we live a life that relies on God when most of Christian Americans today rely too much on what this world has to offer? As opposed to relying on God. And see, when we rely on the things that this world has to offer, we're going to experience the things that this world has to offer, like fluctuating markets and instability and lack of satisfaction and things that constantly break and just all of these things that occur because we're relying and trusting in the things of this world. But when we rely on God, things change. We rely on God and we see what he has to offer of his perfect economy and his stability and really true satisfaction found in him and unbreakable rewards that really last for all eternity. So this morning we're going to see three things about this passage really contextualized and brought into really what's happening in our world today and how we can see that our faith can be strong in the midst of these worldly things that are around to try to lure us in. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at verse 9 first and we're going to see what we know in this world isn't really true. It isn't really right. So he says this, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Now today, many are taught that the secret to success in this world has to offer is 
is that's just it. It's the secret to success is getting all that this world has to offer. But it really re- leads to what I've noticed is a secret to stress in this life. What this world offers us isn't the secret to success, but really it's the secret to stress. And so we see in this time, in this passage of what was happening, that if we think about it, the more we get, the more we have to fix, the more we have to take care of, the more we have to do with the things of this world. Oftentimes, more money means more problems. And so I can remember back when Laura and I first got married and we moved up to North Carolina to go to seminary. And so we we got this apartment that was like a thousand square feet. And I'm like, it's the greatest thing in the world because I could plug in my vacuum cleaner in one spot and hit the entire apartment. I'm like, that is awesome. And then we had kids and had four kids and then we had to get a bigger house. And I'm going, man, I wish I had that where I could plug it in and go, boom, it's all done. But now it's more things that come and more difficulty. And so what do we do with that? The more we possess often and the more times and the things that we have, it takes more of our ability and more of our time and effort to take care of. And so here James says this. He says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. The word lowly is really the word humble. And in this passage, this humbleness really refers to a matter of status as opposed to oftentimes he uses the same word as kind of in the situation of the humble in your attitude, like to be humble to somebody and to humble yourself to somebody. But in this case, he's actually referring to that of humble in status. In other words, the person who is financially poor, this is the believer in Christ that is to boast in his or her high status. I don't know about you, but when you're reading that, it kind of seems like, James, are you making a little bit of sense here? Because this doesn't really make any sense that the poor person is supposed to be excited in their high status when you're like, I don't know about you, but I haven't heard a poor person say, you know, I'm so proud that I have nothing. It's awesome. And so obviously what is happening here in this situation is most likely not being proud that you have nothing and that you are financially poor. But this is what he's talking about because in our lives, most people are proud of their accomplishments. Proud of their houses or our cars or the clothing that we wear, the things that we own or our retirements or 50401ks and all of this type of stuff. But what do we do with this? But James here says the lowly brother, the poor believer, is to boast in his exaltation. And believers who struggle with their finances, they don't have to often worry about their status of being poor because they are poor. But in America today, we all worry about our status. Oftentimes we do. We care about who we are, where we live, what we do, and status is a big deal. If you didn't know that, it is on social media. Even Facebook has your status update. Thought it'd be interesting this morning for you to see some status updates that went awry. And this is what happens sometimes on status and social media because we love it. And so this person, I changed the names due to security reasons, but Jason put it this way, just finished eating a raw chicken breast. Somebody owes me 20 bucks is his status. To which John, his friend, says, you're going to die, dude. Salmon, salmonella for sure. To which Jason then responds, I ate chicken, not salmon, dude. Uh, or this one, I thought this one was good. Jay says, how did people know, notice he spelled it wrong, what roads to take before Google Maps was made? Anybody wonder that? Haley said they used maps. And so Jay says, what? No, I said before Google Maps. People's status updates. And so you're sitting there going, what in the world? I like this one. Sean put it this way. I'm not a taxi service. If you want a lift, I expect money. To which Jamie, a friend, said that would make you a taxi service. Or what about Isabella who put it this way? Long day. Jesus makes things so hard on me. So her friend says, doesn't he? But it's for the best. Just keep him in your heart and keep praying, girl. It will get better. Jesus works in mysterious ways. To which Isabella says, Sue, Jesus is my 14-year-old son. He was suspended from school. (laughs) Or last but not least, Bob put it this way in his status update. I hate Hippocrates. To which Nathaniel, his friend, wrote, You hate the father of Western medicine? Check your spelling. Hypocrites are Hippocrates. Sometimes we do that. We, We boast in our status in life, and it means so much to us. Believers who take who are poor and have a lowly status in this world are to boast in their situation. The word boast there literally means to take pride in. They're supposed to be happy about their status in life. But what is the exaltation to which James is referring to in this passage? I believe that James is really 
reminding the Jewish believers that were scattered and that were confused and were poor and that they had something more valuable than gold and silver and the things of this world and the status that they could have. So what am I referring to is this, is it's a relationship with the Most High God. That's what they get to rejoice in, to rejoice in this situation of their status of living a life as a believer in Jesus. Now, believers that struggle financially now don't have to worry that they are going to be exalted in their relationship with Christ. Even Jesus told a crowd and his disciples this in Matthew 23. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So the humble in status will one day have an exalted status before our Lord because of their relationship with God. You know, being wealthy and having a great status in this world does not grant happiness. It doesn't grant contentment just because you have a lot. Jim Carrey once put it this way, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. And it's not. The material things of this, way, this world are, are, are nothing in compared to all of eternity. And so James wanted the believers to realize that even though they were scattered, some homeless, some now poor, that they were extremely rich in their relationship with God. And that's the case today. It doesn't matter how much we possess that we can be rich in our relationship with Christ. So what, the, what we know about the world isn't really right. Oftentimes it's contradicting what God says. The world tells us one thing, but God says another thing. Poor to rejoice. But what about the second thing I noticed in this passage was we must trust in this world isn't really reliable. Things in this world, we can't trust in them. They're not really reliable, like I said about my AC unit. There's things like that that you expect to work. In verse 10 says this, And the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuit. And as James pointed out, the poor had to rejoice in the fact that their salvation was worth more than anything the world had to offer. They may never receive any of those earthly treasures on earth, but their heavenly treasures would be abundant. But James is now talking to those and pointing to the rich and saying you're to rejoice and exalt in your humiliation. Same word used back in the previous verse. So what does that mean? This world often teaches us that we, if we want to be a success, we've got to keep working and get bigger and better jobs and bigger and better houses and more and more stuff that ultimately won't last, which we think will bring contentment, but in reality won't. The wisest man on the earth, Solomon, even agreed with that in Ecclesiastes when he searched for everything in this life and found out it was meaningless. This is what Solomon said, I have seen everything that is done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and it's striving after the wind that nothing could bring contentment on the earth. All the worldly things that we thought would bring contentment just wouldn't measure up. In verse 10, he says, And the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. The rich oftentimes struggle, have difficulty in this life, and sometimes struggle with pride and temptation. The Bible tells us that in Proverbs 18, 11, A rich man's wealth is in his strong city, and like a high wall his, his, in his imagination. In other words, the person who oftentimes is more wealthy relies on the temporal things of this world as opposed to relying on God. And here, even in verse 10, James point to, points out to the fact that that rich man will die just like the poor man. The same was true back then, and the same is true today. It doesn't matter how much you possess, we're still all going to have a short life, and then it's over on this world. And it's done with. And so James points a vivid picture here of a flower that passes away. And when that sun rises up and the scorching heat withers that grass, that its flower falls and its beauty perishes. Now during the Bible times, it was, this was being written, and in today's times, a, a poor person, what this is kind of referring to is the fact that a poor and a rich person oftentimes would have a different lifespan and life expectancy. And what we come to realize, and even in our society today, the same thing is true. Well, why is that the case? Well, because a wealthy person oftentimes doesn't have to toil the ground and to work a hard job. And so oftentimes the stress of life and the things of that lead to a shorter lifespan. According to the University of Washington, your average life expectancy, watch this, 
now varies by more than 20 years, depending on where you live in the United States. And what they discovered in this study was that the more affluent people in those more affluent areas, the richer areas, those people were the ones who were living longer than those that were living in the poorer areas. And so it gives you a longer life, but the reality of what James was trying to bring down to those people who were rich was the fact is, is they're not immortal. They're going to die just like the poor person is going to die. That flower that's fading away that was going to happen. Solomon, realizing that, of course, that that's not the answer, turned to what is the answer and realizing it's got to be a relationship with the Most High God. He says this in Ecclesiastes 8, 17. Then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. That more important than the things in this world is a relationship with Almighty God. And so James turns to the flower and says its beauty perishes and it falls. And that's how short life is. Thus, church, if we want to look at how short life is, we just turn to the flower. Look at how quickly it blooms and how quickly it dies. And life is over. In this world, I know that we can understand that life is short, like a mobile phone with a low cell. It just happens all the time. In America today, I don't know if you know, but the statistic came out recently that says that in America, 2.5 million Americans die every year. That's a lot of Americans that are dying every year. And what they discovered about this is that one in every four people who pass on and die die because of a heart-related issue. I thought how interesting that is in our world and our society today that many people are walking around with bad hearts, but many more are walking around with spiritually bad hearts. They've not put their faith and their trust in God. And so today, if you've never done that, this may be the day that you get your heart in the right spiritual shape that realizes life is short and I want to live it for God and not for the things of this world. And so we can do that with our actions and our attitude and even with our giving, as Dan mentioned, giving above that 10% tithe to the church, the things that are connected and important during our short lifespan, that reach to the far ends of this earth. And the key here is verse 11, as James wants to bring this back home to the heart of that believer that he's writing to, and this is what he says to them, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. You know, we can try to live for today or we can try to strive for living for things that matter in all of eternity. And so James, knowing that often the rich are sometimes more stingy with their funds, sometimes he, he's pointing them to the reality that they had to remember that life was not about accumulating stuff. It's not about getting more and more stuff. You know, growing up, I can remember as a kid, I'm not too old, but I am a little bit older. I played basketball the other day with James and playing some young kids. And they were like, listen, we're nowhere near as old as you are. And I'm going, man, I'm getting there. And I was rem reminded of putting a study together of a cartoon I used to watch as a kid. And it was DuckTales, if any of you remember that, DuckTales. And so it was Scrooge. And so I can remember watching those movies, and he, had, he was the richest man in the world, but he didn't ever want to use his money. And so sometimes that's what happens. And so this is why James, I believe, is writing this to the rich man to say, listen, you've got to make sure you know what's important in life, and what the key is. And Jesus, even talking about rich and the poor in the situation, said this. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Well, why? Because the focus is off track. And sometimes that's what happens with materialism and the things of this world that it has to offer is our focus becomes shifted on that as opposed to focused on what God wants in our lives. Proof positive of what's happening here is he even mentions it in this passage, and I underlined it. In the midst of, watch this, his pursuits. So in other words, this believer was sidetracked and focused on what their desire was and not what God's desire was. So we today need to find out what is God's desire. What is he desiring me to do? And I believe it is found in the pages of God's word. Psalm 1, 1 through 3 tells us this. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates both day and night. 
And he will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. And watch this. And its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The reality is this, is when we serve God, we will prosper. Now, that doesn't always mean prospering financially. It could, it couldn't. But in essence, it's prospering in our relationship with God that's growing and maturing, that we're getting deeper in love with him. That one day when we go to meet him, we know who he is because we've lived for him and we've learned about him and we've sought him out. And so oftentimes we look at this situation and we know that in this world things are not really right and in this world we can't really trust most of the things in this world. It's not reliable. Things break and we live for it. We're going to be broken in essence. Oftentimes people let us down, but in reality, God will never let us down. And so we see the third thing this morning as I close. What we get in this world isn't really rewarding. You know, that's what Solomon learned. That's what many of us have learned and can preach and teach on, is the fact that what we get in this world oftentimes isn't as rewarding as we thought it would be. And so he says in verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Verses 9 through 11, he focused on teaching us about the difference in economics and the poor and the rich and the situation that they had that was existing during that time period in 44 to 49 AD. And nowadays it's the same thing. Nothing has changed. We all have that same situation of poor and rich. And so James brings both groups to an understanding of what's happening with the trials in their lives and the financial situation that they're in and what they can do about it. And what's important related to what they have and what they have not. So basically the key is this, if you don't have now, don't worry, it's okay. That's not your objective in life. And our objective is to remain steadfast in this passage, immovable under trials. Whether poor, whether rich, it doesn't matter. We're to remain steadfast in our relationship. And once we remain steadfast, he says here, you will receive the crown of life. You know, to what is James talking about here? James first classifies kind of the one who receives this crown as being blessed, and they truly are. Same word used in Jesus' Sermon on Mount and the Beatitudes of blessed is this person, blessed is this person. It's a blessing that we get. It goes beyond just a contentment and a happiness for the day. But it points us to really inner joy that can be found in the life of every believer who's put their faith and trust in God. And if you're poor or rich, you can be blessed. And this person who's blessed receives this blessing when they are remaining steadfast and secure. Now this is oftentimes a difficult grasp to be grasped because God sums up his desire for us to be holy like he is holy. And the person who strives to live the life that Christ is going to live for us, we will have to go through trials. And so we will have to be facing trials and tribulations, but we've got to persevere in the midst of those trials. Now in this passage, is this crown of life to what he's referring to? What does that mean? Well, what we figured out is it does mean salvation. He's talking about salvation and eternal life, not to be confused with those rewards that we receive based on what we've done for Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 14 tells us about that. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Those rewards are different, of course, than what he's referring to in James. James is talking about salvation, just like Peter talked about. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory in 1 Peter 5, verse 4. And Paul even talked about the same thing about persevering through trials, just like James is talking about here to his younger mentee in the faith. In 1 Timothy six twelve. he says, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you were made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Take hold, you're going to have to fight this battle of faith in the midst of things that come in your way. Now, does James say that persevering through these trials saves you? Is that what he's talking about here? I don't believe that's what James is getting at, because remember, he's talking to people who are currently under trials, currently under tribulations, and struggles that they're facing in the world because they've had to move in the midst of persecution. Did that mean that their salvation was gained by their endurance, or was it something different? I believe in no way was their salvation enacted the moment that they endured, but it was enacted the moment they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's how somebody is saved today. 
John MacArthur put it this way, perseverance does not result in salvation and eternal life, but is itself the result and evidence of salvation and eternal life. In other words, the moment we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are saved, we are rescued. And those that are faithful and strong, of course, we will strive to endure till the end to be faithful. But the end of verse 12 tells us that the crown of life, this salvation, this eternal life is what God has promised to those who love him. This morning, many in here love God and have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But there may be somebody this morning that's never done that. And you can see this morning that the difference between worldliness and godliness is a big deal. But God desires that we love him and that we serve him. Even in John three sixteen through 18, it said this, For God so loved the world, right? That he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But watch this in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who love him, in verse 18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This morning, God desires that we make sure that our status is secure, not financially, but that our status is secure in our relationship with him. That that's what God desires for each and every one of us, is that we could put our faith and trust in him and know that we are secure in his capable arms. You know, I'm encouraged about this passage. Because it reveals it doesn't matter what my income is and my relationship with Jesus. Those two don't matter together. But what matters is my relationship with God. That being a follower in Christ does not always mean that I'm going to be on the top of this world and I'm going to be the richest of which. I'm going to be the richest of rich, or possess luxurious this or that. But I'm okay with that. I'm okay with knowing that my life is more than just living for the things of this world. It's for living for Christ. So God has called us, church, to live for him. Denying and dying to ourselves is the call. It's not accruing and achieving. It calls to deny and to serve him by dying in this world, by sacrificing everything that we have for him. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me to humble yourself in situation and status. So we can trust in God and live our lives for him. Our earthly rewards may not be great for many of us. But just remember what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount. Listen to what he said in Matthew 5, 12. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And listen, so we will be persecuted today. We can know that we can have strength to endure through persecution, through trials, through times of difficulty and struggles with finances, they're always going to come in our lives. But we can rejoice that we have faith in something so much greater than the worldly possessions and the worldly things of this day. I'll leave you with a story as I close. The stork flew over a town one day, and back of each wing an infant lay. One to a rich man's home he brought, and one he left at a laborer's cot. The rich man said, my son shall be a lordly ruler over land and sea. The laborer sighed, tis the good God's will that I have another mouth to fill. The rich man's son grew strong and fair and proud with the pride of a millionaire. His motto in life was live while you may, and he crowded years in a single day. He bought position and name and place, and he bought him a wife with handsome face. He journeyed over the whole wide world, but discontent his heart lay curled. Like a serpent hidden in leaves and moss, and life seemed hollow and gold was dross. He scoffed at women and doubted God and died like a beast and went back to the sod. The son of the laborer tilled the soil and thanked God daily for health and toil. He wedded for love in his youthful prime and two lives courted in tune and time. His wants were simple, and simple his creed. To trust God fully, it served his need. Enlightened his labor and helped him to die with a smile on his lips and a hope in his eye. When all is over and all is done, now which of these men was the richer one? This morning I can tell you the one who puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ will always be the richer one. And that could be you this morning. Let's pray. Lord God.
thank you this morning for your word. God, a passage like this is often difficult when we look at. The people during that time period were struggling. Many had given up everything to leave because of their faith in you, God. Because they were being persecuted and afraid of losing their lives to these.